Welcome to Working Better Together. Today we chatted with Rob Stokes, founder of Quirk and chairman of the Red and Yellow School of Business. So I think it was great what we're talking about now, and I love your, um, is that your original concept, you know, the, the giants and the... Juniors and giants. Juniors and giants, yeah. Is, 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 did you come out of a book sure. or...? No, I don't think it did actually. Um, oh, you should uh, write a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely got a catchy title, but I think like most business books, I'd run out of, I'd run out of content after 10 pages. And I'd yeah. To write for the next 300 pages. Yeah. It's, and um, so, I mean, I'm kind of keen to like stick on that for a little bit of it and uh, just discuss it further. So I, I think what I love about that is just uh, obviously the concept of that. And then I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was that I remember listening to one of your talks at at Net Profit a few years ago, and you spoke a lot about uh, Ricardo Semler's book, Maverick, um, and how it inspired you, you know, to create the business that you had and, and grew. And, uh, and I take a lot of that obviously inspired you to facilitate that kind of thinking. So I don't know, can you maybe like draw some of the parallels with that and how, um, what you got out of that book, you know? I think for me, um the main thing I got out of Maverick, and it's worth mentioning that, that I first read Maverick, I think in about 2003, mm. when I quirk, if I'm not mistaken, we were about 10 people. Mm. And my first ever HR, not an internal person, uh, an outsourced uh, chap, a guy called Rob Rankin, amazing human being. Um, he was our outsourced HR department back in those days. And he gave me this book and said it had really impacted him. And I read it and I thought, this is amazing, but it doesn't matter, we're too small. Mm. Um, and uh, I re reread it probably three or four years later and it changed Quirk forever and for me the, the most important thing in that book comes down to uh, treating people like responsible adults wow. and the way he puts it in the book is that if you can trust people to raise children uh, which is about as adult a responsibility as you can get as you know Gary children mm. are not the yeah. easiest thing in the world um, then why wouldn't you trust them more in your business? Or he put it one day, if you hope that someone will check their email on a Sunday, why wouldn't you let them go to the movies on a Monday afternoon? And I remember reading this book and um, I think I was halfway through it or, or, or had just finished it. And one of our staff, who was a really top performer, a guy called Greg, came to us um, and he resigned. And I was totally taken aback because he, you know, he's, he's great and, and, you know, we got along really well. And, and I said to him, well, what's happened here? It was all going so well. And he said, look, his hobby is, um, I don't know if it's bodybuilding or muscle building or, you know, uh, mm. tanning yourself up and getting ripped, basically. Mm. And, um, and he said he just can't put the time needed into that when he has to share the gym with the rest of the world at rush hour. And so he was gonna go and freelance and get a more flexible lifestyle so that he didn't have to work normal office hours and he could pursue this passion of his. And I said to him, well, why don't you just go at 11 o'clock in the morning when it's the quietest and you know, just do your work around that? Cause I trust you, you're good at your job, you trust us, uh, let's go. And the look on his face changed my life forever because it was one of, astonishment actually that uh, a company would let him do that and he, yeah I cut long story short he ended up staying with us for a long time and did get very ripped and was really good at SEO and so wow. he benefited by treating him like an adult I think he was disproportionately loyal to Quirk because we gave him that level of respect and mm. so ever since then my my approach to management has always been one of uh, judging people on outcomes yeah um, Standard line I've used for years is if you get your job done on time at the highest level of quality to, to the expectations, then I don't care how you do it and where you do it. Mm -hmm. and, and if your best time to work, as it is for many people, it used to be for me, my most productive hours used to be until I had children, about nine in the evening to about three in the morning. It meant that the next morning until lunch was a write-off, but what I got done in those six hours, I could beat most work days. Mm -hmm. um, and why not try and tap into that? And so, you know, at Quirk, we had, for example, one lady who's actually still there. She's been there, gosh, must be coming up to 15 years. Um, she, uh, a very senior person now, but since day one, uh, well, since, since day trust, because I, I don't give it to people up front, you've got to earn a bit of trust. Mm. Um, she gets into work 
I'm not joking, at about four in the morning and leaves two or three in the afternoon. And like me, she doesn't do traffic. Uh, I avoid it like the plague. So she spent very little time, and she lived in a place that would have had extreme traffic, spends a very little time in the traffic. Uh, she is an early bird, so getting up early was never a problem. Uh, and she gets to enjoy her afternoon, uh, just has to go to bed a bit earlier than, than most people. Um, and she an unbelievably productive person. And it it's actually feels like an absolute no-brainer to be able to play to someone's strengths. And recently I read a book uh, um, by, by um, Scott Adams, uh, How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big. And uh, a terrific book. And, and one of the lessons I got out of that was around um, adjusting your, your schedule and your priorities based on your energy levels because different people are different. And so for me, uh, I now, thanks to children who don't wake up at four in the morning, but they have broken me into that habit. Yeah. I now wake up at four or five in the morning. And um, I find now it's incredibly productive. And so I have set types of work that I, I don't do creative work that time of day because I'm not very creative, but I'm very productive. Yeah. And so stuff that I've just got to get through, piles of emails, producing documents, <clears throat> sometimes catching up on some reading, reading board packs. I do that between four, five to seven, eight in the morning. And then by, by the time eight o'clock hits, I feel like I can tick off a huge chunk of my to-do list and then go into a series of meetings and, and, and then have some creative time in the day, which actually I think is the most valuable time. Um, and, I, and I want to build an organization that gives people that same opportunity. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think most companies, organizations, they're more focused on the input and not on the outcomes. You know? So they're, like, they're all about time and attendance and having people in offices, whereas... I firmly believe the future of work is not people being in offices and working nine to five. You know, I think it can work with, with certain types of companies, but you're definitely not going to attract the right kind of talent, you know, and the right kind of people that's going to take your, your organization further. So um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. And it's, it's not only about getting the most out of people, but as you said, it's about attracting people. Yeah. I had a friend who recently sold a business to a big listed company and, and he's a very, very intelligent person. And mm. he's also a, a worker, uh, even though he sold his business to this big company, mm. uh, he didn't have any desires to retire, even though he could, he joined their board. Um, and has recently left because he was at, at a at board level of a company in the billions. Um, he was ch clocking in and clocking out each day. Um, and as he said, it's just, that's not how he wants to work. And there's no question in my mind that this, uh, this human would be an incredibly valuable addition to any organization. And they've lost him purely because such a silly thing. They want to yeah. sit in traffic in the morning. He doesn't want to do it. The world has changed a lot. And then I think keeping those outdated mindsets is a disadvantage. I've also seen some of, uh, some of our local clients in, that are le like running one of the most leading like, uh, software engineering firms in, in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, you know, they're obviously tra trying to attract engineers and one of the criteria is that you've got to be at the office and they're losing about 50% of the applicants because you know, they just don't want to be in offices at certain times. They can get more work done by sitting in their home at Musenberg and clocking in for a lunchtime surf um, and knowing they're going to get great output. But unfortunately, the organization doesn't want to do that. So um, it's quite a bit of a, it's an ongoing debate right now. Obviously, this remote working um, aspect. But um, when, when millennials hit senior management, things are going to change pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's something about that. When millennials hit senior management, you know, whether the reality yeah. is we've got one generation that manages the younger generation. And yeah. I, I obviously I've only been around 39 years myself, but I don't think there's ever been an intergenerational change like we have right now. Yeah. And, and so the, the mismatch of, of cultural desires between those two levels in an organization is vast. Um, but those millennials, you know, um, depending on how you class a millennial, the other day I was somewhere they put me as a millennial, they said 97. <laughs> I don't feel like a millennial, but you know, if millennials are now 40 years old or close to it, um, they're, they're moving into senior leadership positions. And, and I think we'll start to see big blue chip companies making those kind of changes. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and, so, wow, this discussion, we could go on for days, but uh, tell me one of your biggest learnings over the last 10 or 15 years, just with managing people, you know, I mean, you started a company, uh, you grew it and you sold it. Uh, you worked with amazing people. And now obviously you're onto some of your new ventures with Red and Yellow and some of your investments. 
is there anything that you've learned through this process that you, that you would have changed? You know? I mean, obviously failure is always good. Uh, it's good to learn from it. I mean, is there anything that you have maybe changed into some of the failures? With respect to people? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would say that the, the realization, the deep realization, because it gets thrown at you as a, as a piece of uh, uh, advice, but you have to really realize it, is that people are the number one source of both pain and pleasure in an organization. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at you know, any company, all it really is, is an aggregation of people. Um, yes, you know, some companies have got big machines, but people built those machines. And so I do really believe that the people with the best people win. But if you appreciate that people are the biggest source of pain and pleasure, then it, you adjust your approach to people. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Certainly for me, I got caught, away, caught up with this, but, you know, as a young person starting at Quirk, you know, I was in my 20s and, you know, you, you know, bump into people, old yourself, oh, you got a business, how many staff do you employ? It's the first question everyone asks. And yeah. your, 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 your ego wants to throw out a big number. Um, my ego no longer wants to throw out a big number. My ego wants to say as few as possible. So the ones that are there are amazing because yeah. it, it, a big staff count will come with an exponential growth in headaches. Um, and so for me, my philosophy now is small, tight, focused teams um, where I, I would rather, and, and hopefully the teams would agree with us in the long run, they might not in the short run, but I'd rather people were, people were a bit more stretched for a bit longer so that we, we, we search a bit harder to find that person who's a bit better uh, rather than saying, I'm too busy, let's hire the first person off the street. Because um, when you multiply that out by hundreds of people, it's a world of pain. And then business stops being fun. Where when you're surrounded by a, a, a team that's maybe 20% smaller than it could be, because you've been a bit more selective and taken a bit longer to hire, but the team is good and they're tight and, and they, the people are world class, uh, both in terms of their uh, abilities uh, and professionalism uh, and in terms of just being fun to work with. Mm. It's the best way to work ever because you know yeah. working purely by yourself is actually quite boring. Um, but it takes quite a bit of discipline, I find, certainly for me, uh, to really keep the numbers as small as they can be. You know, there's that saying, um, hire slow, fire fast, that yeah. every business leader knows and at best half follow. Um, I still don't think I follow it well enough, but we say that to ourselves every day uh, at Red and Yellow. Just take our time on the hiring. I'd rather lose people that are impatient than risk hiring someone that... Uh, it takes the organization back because it also affects and dilutes your culture as well you know so yeah. that, that one bad apple with an organization i mean that's maybe just a, a maybe something to end off with i mean what do you think some like a in terms of like a your mindset in terms of retaining a really great culture you know and how to protect that culture you know i think maybe i mean you can do that but we're not hiring too quick but then how do you like validate and and, and ensure that you know as people start within the first few months that they're, they're right fit within the teams Look, I'll say this. I don't think I'm the best at onboarding. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've got too much stuff in my head and I just, my head just thinks everyone knows what's in my head and therefore why would I onboard you? Because you know what's in my head, which is obviously ridiculous. There must be an app um, for that. What's in my head, yeah, onboarding.com. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that actually because um, I was listening to the Scaling Up podcast four or five months ago and they interviewed a chap um, who has built a piece of software called Trainual. And he used this line, which was, I built it because my business was in my head and I wanted to get it out. And I thought, whoa, that's me. And um, I and think I'm a every entrepreneur. Hey? I mean, that's literally, because yeah. yeah. you hear employees and, moaning, you know, you hear employees moaning saying, you know, you just, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and like, I don't know what to do. And I didn't get told and Rob didn't let me know. And like, everyone just gets in my life. Yeah. So I, I think we must have been one of the first five or 10 uh, users on the software platform. Mm. Uh, as a result, we've got a, we've got a really good deal uh, and we've got the whole of Red and Yellow using it. Mm. Um, and it's not an onboarding tool, it does onboarding, um, but it's really an internal learning system that's really simple and easy to use. Mm. Um, this is not a promotion, eh? Hey? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I actually, I just love, I love, I love the tool. I should tell Chris, who's the founder. Uh, yeah, so give put me a referral code at the end, you know? <laughs> I know. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, the one thing I've, I've learned, which, which doesn't uh, come naturally to me, I'm not a very good manager. 
Um, mm. I'm a bit all over the place. I'm not too details focused. But the one thing I really try to have discipline on uh, these days is giving people a really well thought out and documented uh, career path. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, it really gives people uh, two things. It makes them realize that you actually do care about their future. Mm. Um, and that's, that's a big thing. Um, and then it gives them something to work towards. It, it says, you know, my boss cares about me and he showed me how to get to the place I want to get to. And so I have this formula that I use, uh, which I really believe in. It's a bit cheesy, which is skills plus motivation plus expectation equals success. So, uh, okay. Let's start with the expectation thing. Um, so expectation is this very specifically is what I need from you and also vice versa. So uh, I think it's often at Red and Yellow, we have what we call a performance agreement. So it's not KPIs or anything. It's an agreement, which is, is by definition bi-directional. So uh, the, the, the staff member says, I commit to doing these things in this quarter or this year. And, and the, the school says, we commit to doing these things. So treating you fairly, running an organization with good values, paying you on time, et cetera, et cetera. So you want um, uh, it, it's really about documenting the outputs, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then with those expectations 100% clear between uh, both parties, the, the staff member and the organization, then you can have the conversation around skills and motivation. Then, and both of those have to um, be driven by the employee. I mean, uh, the manager's got to get it out. But the, if the employee looks at the expectations, they must say, I do not have the skills for this. Yeah. If they say I have the skills and they, I have the motivation and they don't succeed, it's their fault. Yeah. If they say, I have neither the skills nor the motivation, the manager can then fix those issues. Um, if they don't fix them, it's then their fault. Um, but if those three things are in place, success is guaranteed. And, okay. and so for me, I find that many companies are quite good at the three to six months, even 12 month expectations. But it's a fairly recent realization of mine is that giving someone not quite expectations, but kind of this is where I see your role evo evolving over three years and therefore your career. And it's not, it's about, I, I guess, moving beyond the inflation based salary increase to let's really grow you as a person so that you become more valuable. So then you're not just increasing your salary by inflation, but you increasing it because you're getting promotions and you're growing and you, your, your mm -hmm. values organization is such that it's worth paying you more. And it, it really says, sends a message to people that this, organization cares about me and then they've got something to aim at and i find most managers don't do it because it takes time and thought but really you know you can probably spend one hour two hours a year per employee on that simple document two or three pages outlining how you want it to go i even like to put the different salary brackets when you achieve certain levels uh, brilliant yeah. um, so it shows a red map and, yeah, exactly and and it just it just sends such a beautiful message to people and i find that those people have done that well uh, much more higher chance of delivering on it and much more chance of, of long-term loyalty in the organization and a happier uh, start. Okay, brilliant. Well, listen, this was amazing. I mean, we could easily do a second part of this, so we, I'm sure we should definitely catch, uh, catch up later. Um, just to wrap up, I mean, you mentioned some of the books. Is there any books that has inspired you besides Maverick and Scaling Up? Is there anything that else that you've, that's, uh, that's kind of a really like put you in this direction you know that's inspired you i think the book i've read recently that's inspired me the most is mindset by carol dweck okay which uh every parent in the world should read it and every business leader or manager in the world should read it and the simple crux of the book is uh, the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset a fixed mindset believes that skills and attributes and abilities are fixed Growth mindset believes anything is possible. I have always been that latter person. I've just never had the words to put to it. Yeah. What I realize now is the danger of fixed mindset people. Now, everyone has a certain amount of fixed mindset, even myself. I've now read the book and I've analyzed parts of my life. I mean, in business, I have no fixed mindset. I think anything's possible. Probably too much so, but too optimistic. Yeah. Um, in sport, I'm quite fixed mindset. I've kind of got in my head, I'm never going to be as good at Dale Stain as fast bowling, at fast bowling, and therefore I should be a spinner. But now that I've read the book, I feel like running in a bit quicker. Um, but actually, I think it's helped me in two levels. Help me manage people who are fixed mindset people, which in my experience is about 30, 40% of the population, which is big. Um, and it's so easy to 
just the awareness of the two mindsets solves half the problem. Because people can then start self-diagnosing and actually saying, actually, why, why am I limiting myself here? Yeah. But the place where I'm really trying to use the book, and I haven't quite solved this, um, and I've actually, I've got, uh, I've got book club tonight, uh, business <laughs> book club, true story, where we, where we sit and drink beers and review business Every books. week or two uh, weeks or month? Every couple of months. Um, okay. And um, this is the topical book for tonight at my insistence, because... Uh, I have two sets of questions I want to discuss with the group. Uh, the one is, what are the words I should say to my children? Because the book gives some examples, but you quickly run out of them when you've got four children. Mm. Um, and you realize how uh, we are breeding, for the most part, we are breeding fixed mindset children without even realizing it. Just mm. saying to your child, uh, well done, you really clever, is a huge mistake. It should be, well done, you tried really hard. Because clever is a fixed attribute. Trying really hard will take you through your entire life. Oh my goodness, um, I, need to, I need to get this book. Yeah, yeah, I know. When you read this book, you, as a parent, you'll be hitting yourself in the head. Uh, but it's great to read. And then the other thing I, I, need, uh, I want to discuss with uh, the book club is how to create tests uh, for fixed and growth mindset at, at the employment stage. Because I do believe that most fixed mindset people can be moved to a growth mindset. But I'm not in the business of uh, curing the world of their fixed mindset. So I would rather just hire growth mindset people and make them great than have to do the extra job of convincing someone with a fixed mindset that they can actually be better than they think they yeah. are. This is just doubling um, down on your strengths. Then. Well, even that, I mean, it's, it's also to say that maybe your weaknesses aren't as weak as you think. Um, mm. You know, it, it, I guess the classic example of fixed mindset is telling a child their IQ at a young age. Because if it's really high, then they think they don't need to work. And then if it becomes an insult, if I haven't put effort in, I can't be that clever. Mm. Fixed mindset people love an excuse. Growth mindset people don't believe in excuses because everything is a growth opportunity. I don't mind if I fail because I'm growing. Whereas a fixed mindset person won't run a race. If they're going to lose it, they'll find an excuse. Oh my, I've got a sore foot because they don't want to lose. And, and a growth mindset person just wants to run the race and uh, do as well as they possibly can. Yeah. I've, I've found some tests, fly fishermen, you cannot be a fixed mindset fly fisherman because you've chosen to make your sport disproportionately harder for no good reason. Uh, so you must be a growth mindset person. Yeah. And the other one is actually um, hobby runners because you know, a hobby runner knows they're not going to win. So all they're doing is competing against themselves and therefore they don't believe their attributes are fixed. They believe they can get better every day and they, mm. they're entering a race, they have no chance of winning. Uh, and that makes me feel better about coming 7,000th in the combats. That's a, um, we can run a whole episode on this. <laughs> but, okay, so just to wrap up, I mean, I, I normally ask what books you read, and I think you've answered that. And any podcast that you've been listening to that's been blowing your mind? Sure, I'm so far behind on my podcast, but I, I do enjoy them. Um, the Knowledge Project I'm enjoying. Shane Parrish's voice is a bit too boring uh, for my liking. Um, but he gets some really good people on the podcast. I'm quite a Tim Ferriss fan, but I'm also very okay with skipping some of his episodes. Yeah, um, it's like half ads in his ones. No, no, you learn quickly, fast forward the first six minutes. Um, but I think I found with podcasts and actually with books, um, and this doesn't come naturally to me, I'm learning the skill of getting five, 10, 30 minutes in, even halfway through a book and saying, I'm not going to finish this book. Yeah. which I really struggle with. I mean, I will finish the worst movie in the world just to finish it. And yeah. I realized that, you it's know, I, it actually it all came from a podcast where some chap who's being interviewed said, you know, best case scenario, you've got another 200 books to read in your life. And yeah. there's probably 2 million that you could read. Why would you go one page through a book that doesn't want to be in that two, top 200? Brilliant, yeah. And, Oh, I'm trying to follow that philosophy. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining us on the on the, on this episode. Uh, just for the audience out there, is there any way they can reach you by the the yep. social media? Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm at Rob Stokes uh, at Twitter. Um, I'm Rob Stokes on Facebook, but I don't use it much. Um, and then you can find me on redandyellow.co.za. Brilliant. Well, I, we didn't get to talk much about red and yellow, but I'd love to maybe pick that up in another episode and chat with you. Awesome. Brilliant. Thanks a lot Thank for the show. Give me a high five.